So hi, my name is Don Thompson. I'm an assistant director and group leader in the Cell Circuits program here at the Broad. Our group is interested in understanding a central question in biology, which is how do we look at, at an organism's DNA, its genotype, and understand how this produces an organism's complex traits and behaviors, or its phenotype. This is a critical to understanding all aspects of biology from the evolution of new species to understanding the genetic basis of disease. The Broad Institute has its, at its root the Human Genome Project and the sophisticated sequencing technologies and analysis pipelines have since been used to sequence hundreds of genomes from additional species. And this led to the birth of a new discipline, actually, called comparative genomics, in which the DNA sequence of and also genomic features of different organisms are compared. And this allowed us to trace uh, large-scale evolutionary events and also to identify functional components of genomes that were conserved across evolution. These studies led to a big surprise in that um, the complexity of organisms did not really correlate highly with their gene content or their gene number. For example, humans share almost all of their genes with other vertebrate species like dogs and apes, and also many genes with the simple eukaryote baker's yeast. That means that since we all have the same genetic toolbox, that it's likely when these genes are expressed, which is when they are turned off and when they are turned on, that was likely rewired during the course of evolution to get these new phenotypes. So what we really need to do is compare gene expression across species to understand how this has occurred. Now this is a very difficult problem, so our group started to focus on uh, a simple group of eukaryotes that includes baker's yeasts. These, these species have a lot of really interesting phenotypes, including important differences in their carbon metabolism that parallels our own physiology. For example, baker's yeast and its close relatives prefer to ferment glucose in, and make high amounts of carbon dioxide, which is necessary for baking, which is why it's called baker's yeast, and also a high amounts of alcohol. Whereas other sets of yeast species are respiratory yeast species, and they respire glucose into carbon dioxide in water, much like our normal cells do. Interestingly, cancer cells also adopt a fermentative metabolism. It's called the Warburg effect. Um, people didn't understand why a cell would adopt such an inefficient way to use glucose because um, when you use a fermentative metabolism to make um, uh, carbon dioxide and in the mammalian system lactate instead of ethanol, you don't make as much energy from the glucose molecule as you do if you, do, if you fully respire it, right? So people were really puzzled why this occurred. So when we did our studies in yeast, we uncovered some expected results. We knew that, though, that gene expression of mitochondrial genes would likely be rewired, and we did see that. But what we also saw in the yeast is that genes for purine or nucleotide metabolism were also, and also certain, for certain amino acids like glycine and serine that fed into this nucleotide metabolism were also rewired. When people looked at, the, at parallels for this in the cancer, they started to see that the same genes that we share between yeasts and us are also rewired in the cancer cells. And so it allowed us to open up many, we have many more candidates in the yeasts than people have been looking at in the cancer cells, so we have many excellent candidates for future study.